Bonjour, my name is Ali. I work at Google, where I lead the security and anti-abuse research team. Today, I would like to talk about how we approach account security at Google in the hope that the lesson we learn might be useful to you to better protect your users. Before getting started, let me mention that the slide you're about to see are available on my website at the URL visible on the video, if you would like to follow along or look at them later on. With this as a way, let's get started. To put some context around the difficulty of protecting account, uh, a recent study we run with, uh, in partnership with Harris uh, showed that about four out of 10 internet users on, in the US had their account compromised one way or another. They show you the extent of how important it is to protect account very seriously because there is a real threat and many users have experienced some form of hijacking. So if we are to protect account, the first question we need to ask ourselves is how do hackers get in and how do they compromise account? Overall, over the years, we found that the, the bulk of the account compromise can be uh, split into three main sources. The first one is, and it's a lot in the press, is data breaches. A lot of the account compromise came from those massive dumps uh, which are on the internet because users reuse passwords. The second one is phishing, where uh, the attacker counterfeit a fake email or a fake website and get the credential of the users that way. Last but not least, something which is on the rise in the last year or so with cookie theft is keyloggers, which are malware on the PC, which store the cookies or the login and password of the user and send them to the attacker. Under the hood, there is a vast black market which is fueling the account compromise ecosystem where hundreds of thousands or even millions of credentials are sold uh, by hackers to other hackers from people who compromise website to people who install Keylogger to the people who exploit account. Uh, those are different people. Some run scams uh, based using the compromised account whereas others specialize into uh, those um, credential compromise harvesting, if I would say. And here are some examples of things you can buy on the black market from data breaches, you can buy uh, routinely, and the press have shown that a lot, but also you have keyloggers that you can buy, which are easy to install with undetectable version, which are able to bypass AVs, or at least how to claim. And of course, phishing kits, which allow hackers to create very easily uh, web pages to collect a credential by pretending to be uh, online services such as Gmail. Although some of them, as you can see on the picture, are very bad imitations of the real login page, but they tend to work. So in 2016, we ran a study, uh, about a year long study on to understand how big is each of those source of credential. It's a of course, a lower bound, and it's only what we could understand and find from those black market. But we do believe that at that point in time, the data breach market were by far the biggest one with 4.3 billion stolen credentials available. Uh, phishing were representing about 12 million accounts which were compromised at the year, and Keylogger were about 1 million. As I mentioned, as protection get, got better in the last four years, uh, the number of accounts stolen by Keylogger have probably increased drastically, whereas phishing have decreased a little bit. So the way to think about those type of compromise is to put them on a scale where the y-axis is the volume, as we discussed, but also the risk is the other axis, which is on the x. And the risk means when you've been in a data breach or when you've been phished or if you've been a victim of a keylogger, how likely are you uh, to get compromised? And so when your data breach, uh, some passwords are reused and some passwords are retested against other services, right? Because they have to blindly test them to see if there is password we use. So the risk is a little bit lower than let's say Keylogger, where your password are very often reused by the attacker. Phishing is somewhere in between where some of your account have been reused across. When they fish have been attempted to other services, but a little bit less we think about than Keylogger. And last but not least, on the extra extreme tips of the thing and the scale is a little bit not a uh, high tool enough, I would say. We have targeted attacker, which are very, very low volume because they only target journalists, dissidents, and people who are of interest of nations. And those, when compromised, are actively exploited. Although with the 
uh, massive uh, solar wind bridge and others, of course, uh, the scale might be a little bit higher these days. So the takeaway about how I can't get compromised is under the hood, there is a large black market, which is actually making the exchange of credential between criminals very fluid and uh, very active, which explains why there is so many compromises on the internet or why they pop everywhere. Uh, password we use is by far the largest source of compromise because users tend to use the same password again and again. And when one website got compromised, there is this massive snowball effect of those, comp those accounts being reused elsewhere. Last but not least, phishing and keylogger do pose a significant risk. The volume is maybe a little bit lower or significantly lower than password we use, but still, uh, those accounts, these are millions of accounts, and those accounts are stolen credentials are uh, very, very actively exploited. So now that we understand a little bit better where these credentials come from, the question becomes, how do we prevent account compromise? Well, if you look at the literature or if you look on the internet or you read articles, there is a lot of technology uh, to actually increase security of account from stronger password, to SMS verification, to security keys, to two-factor authentication, to using a reset code, to using secret questions, to using a pin code, to using CAPTCHA to prevent uh, automation, to using machine learning to do risk analysis and so forth. And many of those technology, you can use one or the other and they somewhat are competing. So there is a very mature set of technology we can use. The problem is, and that's a very important point, which is sometimes overlooked, is every time you increase security, it comes at the expense of additional user friction, whether you are increasing the odds of the user being locked out, or you increase the cost for the user, because let's say if you want them to have a security key, they have to buy one, which is not cheap, or you have to educate them about how to use a system. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, you would push against uh, non-standardized solution is everyone, if everyone were out their own solution, then the user have to learn 20 authentication system and it's not practical as we will see later on. So all in all, account security is at its core, a very difficult and complex balance where we try to balance usability and security to build the best trade-off possible to protect accounts. So today, what I would like to walk you through is how at Google we are balancing those technology. Of course, there are other technologies you could use and there are other trade-offs you could make depending on your use cases. But what I'm going to focus on is how we, which technology we tend to favor, how we tend to combine them to offer what we tr try to be the best account security and usability possible uh, for our users. The way we're going to go about it is we're going to go through the whole kill chain from the account is, the credential is stolen to the account is hijacked. And we're going to see how we layer on each of the technology with difference in depth, right? So the first step, as we mentioned, is somewhere, somehow the credentials are compromised. Phishing, keylogger, password reuse. Here, what we try to do is have some technologies who are proactive and try to prevent user to get Compromise, right? First step. Next, well, the credential is exfiltrated and now a stolen credential database is built and is about to be resold. Here, what we can do is a sort of a race where we try to reset proactively the account credential if we're aware of them before the bad guy is exploiting them. Hopefully after those two steps, we have reduced the exposure quite a bit. And then now, sadly, there is a remaining set of accounts which are compromised. And then here, we try at login time to perform risk analysis and try to reduce uh, the, the amount of account and the unauthorized login by the bad guys. And last but not least, some users are facing additional threat and uh, which are due to the fact that they're facing advanced attackers such as uh, state sponsored attackers. And for those, we need kind of a different type of security where we're going to make a different trade-off and then we'll touch upon our advanced protection program at the end of this talk. So first step, how we can try to prevent credential theft. 
Well, um, the idea is let's build very large scale AI system that can detect and block threat at scale. Right? We try to scale to the internet to prevent or block threat before they are reaching users. Uh, the most famous program Google is running to do that, and there are others who do the same, of course, is uh, what's called safe browsing, which was the first one, I believe, in that space, where the idea is we analyze all the pages which are indexed by a Google search index and as well as other form of, uh, and we show warning uh, based on the one we believe are malicious, whether it's because they are compromised or because they are running a library which is compromised or because they are running malicious ads, right? And so what we show uh, to the user is those famous red warning where we say, hey, be careful, there is danger ahead uh, from a malware or phishing, right? Here is an example of the safe browsing warning on a Android devices for phishing website. Uh, in, in both of, of those cases, we rely on those very large scale system to try to deter user to enter a place where we know they might be harmed. Uh, and we really focus on high precision to make sure that those warnings are really meaningful and there is a real risk around it. So there's a lot of difficulty on how to build a UI, which is understandable for the users. Uh, I would have, uh, for those who are watching YouTube, a link down below to additional talks about uh, designing usable warning because it has been a, a very, very large effort uh, to make sure they are understandable. And there's a lot of nuances that might be taken into account if you are trying to show warning to your users. Uh, to give a sense of how big is the thing, uh, the Google Transparency Report says that we are showing tens of millions of warning every week to all the user and say, hey, please uh, don't go to that website, please don't get compromised. Uh, and as in as 2019, uh, when before this report was retired, uh, we were experiencing a very drastic shift from using malware uh, ver to actually having more phishing websites, uh, as you can see on the graph. Uh, since then, uh, as I said, keylogger is on the rise a little bit, but phishing sites remain very, very prevalent, uh, specifically, specifically due to coronavirus and the COVID, right, where there was a lot of scam around uh, the pandemic. Similarly, for email, we have large scale machine learning system which are meant to detect phishing and malware. Overall, we do believe we stop about 100 million phishing email every day. And that gives you a sense of the volume of how much attempts there is against the account. And we believe that removing them do reduce significantly the exposure of our users. Uh, one of the difficulties when you build those very large scale machine learning system is they are not stable. So to contrast things, if you were to try to use machine learning to recognize cats bearing a nuclear winter, uh, the cat looks the same, right? The cat which were in ancient Egypt uh, were probably very close to the one in middle age to the one which during Renaissance to the modern cat, right? The cat might be more famous these days, but they are still look the same, right? So you could train the machine learning once and be done. On the flip side of that, if we look at how phishing pages look like and how people are using different phishing pages uh, to try to fish our users, they've been evolving quite a bit. Those are a little bit outdated example, but you can see that from the early days to the new days, the design have evolved quite a bit. And that means that we have to retrain machine learning constantly and it's not once and for all for whole deal, it's a dynamic system. And I have a whole talk again on how are the challenges of applying AI for security. And one of them is clearly the adversarial dynamic nature of the data we are classifying, where every day new things are coming in. Uh, to give you a, that in context, we do believe, uh, I, one of our latest measurements shows that about 68% of the phishing email that are blocked by Gmail today are different from one day to another. They are not completely different, to be honest. It's just that they are variation of text, they are variation of colors, they are variation of icons, but they are different. And so we have to be very, very careful of having well generalizable machine learning that are able to pick up more of the meaning and the intent behind the email, which is very, very difficult, uh, rather than just classifying known things. That's why, for example, we have to resort to machine learning rather than, let's say, a list of 
bad hashes because of the dynamic nature of the thing. So all in all, uh, this is what is called the Red Queen hypothesis, uh, I think, in evolutionary, uh, which is this idea that security is essentially for us something where we take all our running to just say ahead of our attackers and to maintain good security, we have to consistently invest. And of course, that is very, very hard from, uh, let's say, a management perspective if you're in a smaller company because the benefit of keeping investing into security and keeping improving the model and keeping working on it are not obvious because, well, nothing happened. That's the goal of security is nothing should happen. And so that's one of the difficulties. But yes, there is absolutely a need to continuously improve and returning detection system because they are becoming obsolete quite uh, quickly. Now, there is a problem, which is there is a decision boundary in machine learning, right? So essentially, whether it's email or account, it's like pass, put in the inbox or log in, or not pass, been denied. Now, the problem is sometimes we don't know because the machine learning most often do not have enough context. For example, an email might be suspicious, but there is, it's not a large scale company, it maybe just an email to one person, and then the machine learning can't generalize and decide whether or not what to do. In that case, we have to deal with what we call a borderline case, where we think it's suspicious, but we do not have enough of the machine learning, do not have enough confidence to make a decision. In that case, um, our strategy is to provide as much context as we can to the user and let them make the final decision. Uh, that's not ideal because we need to get sure the user understands what we say, and that's very, very difficult, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But all in all, we found that it is the most effective strategy. So for example, we spent a lot of time, I think uh, two years ago, to redo some of the banner you see on Gmail with more brighter, colorful uh, warning, which are literally embedded into the email to make sure that people pay attention to them and say, hey, we think it might be phishing. We're not really sure. Uh, please pay extra attention to it. So here's an example of where we try to provide context and we have an help on the right side that you can see and we try to ask people whether they want to proceed or even tell Google that it's confirmed phishing. And every time, by the way, you report to confirmed phishing, it helps the machine learning to learn and it helps to protect everyone. So if you happen to have one of the phishing email into your inbox, the best thing you can do is reporting it to Google so we can actually learn from it. Okay, as I said, one of the challenges with this approach is the user needs to understand what you say. And that is very, very difficult because one of our latest surveys shows that 45% of internet users don't even know what phishing is. So we show them a warning, say, hey, you might get phished. The problem is we think at least a significant fraction of the internet user do not understand what we said and are not able to make the best decision for themselves. So there is clearly a need for education and keep telling people even the basic thing in a probably a different way so that they understand what they're getting themselves into and can better protect themselves. We really need to empower users uh, to make the best decision possible because ultimately in the difficult cases, we have to rely on them because there is no easier or there is no clear other option. So the takeaway about how we can try to reduce the, the amount of certain uh, compromise, not certain, reduce the amount of certain credential and reduce overall account compromise by being proactive and having those large scale system is, well, prevention is indeed the first layer of defense. And those programs have been extremely successful uh, across all web browser, whether it's Safari, Chrome, Edge, Firefox. They all have this warning system which we really believe make a huge difference in the world and have blocked and reduced quite a bit in the last 10 years a lot of the attack surface. Running those systems is very costly and require constant improvement because of course every time you block something the attacker spends a lot of effort and time uh, to go back and be able to bypass it or try to bypass it and so it's a constant cat and mouse game and you have to be on point all the time and there is no resting period, right? And then as I mentioned, all of this requires a user to understand the information we are giving to them. And I think that's where in, where of the place where it's the hardest to do. And that's where usability and education comes in. And those are difficult.
Uh, it's very, very difficult to design a good warning. And it's also today unclear how much people understand because they do they lack the context or the information to make the best decision. So we are fighting warning fatigue and we are, fi we are also dealing with users who are in need of education which that they might not even want to, to learn about. So that's kind of like really the difficulty here. Okay, so the second section that we mentioned is, well, the user got their account compromised, so what can we do now? Well, that happened a lot due to uh, mostly password breaches, right? So a website, either it's a disgruntled uh, intern, like in the LinkedIn case, or there is some account, some vulnerability into WordPress or any other CMS system, or there is an SQL injection in that website or this or that. At the end of the day, the database is leaked and the password which were hashed with older hash technologies like SHA-1 or even MD5 are cracked by the bad guy and they come up with a massive list of login and password that they're going to try to resell to other hacker which will try to use them on various services. We call that password washing. So they basically keep only the one which works and then they resell them to the other hacker which specialize into scamming people or like money mule scheme or like refund or mugged in London scheme and stuff like that. So the reason why this is so effective and so deadly to our user is because again, according to the same uh, Harris uh, Google poll we, we did, 60% uh, of the users in the US, I'm sure in the internet overall, it's almost the same, are reusing password across online services, right? They have one password and they reuse it or they have, you know, five versions of it. One is more secure than the other because there may might be a one at the end or maybe one to three at the end or something like that. But at the end of the day, they have a limited amount of password, which are all heavily related and bad guys know that and exploit that fact very actively. Um, in the same pool, we ask, okay, how do you come up with your password? Well, 33% use their pet name. 23% choose their own name, which is like from the email, you can guess it. Uh, some use their spouse partners and some of them use their child's name. And as you can see, when you have tested all of those things, which is basically common names and animal names, you have reached uh, almost a lot of the uh, password on the internet by those tactics. So cracking the hash is quite easy. So the one thing we can do as a community to really prevent that problem is to get user to use a password manager who will ensure they have one password for each website, which is distinct and hopefully they will generate it. So it will be also hard to crack. Yes, that is also creating another whole set of usability problem because people need to know what a password manager is and we are creating a single point of failure, which is if you lose your master password, do you lose all your passwords? So that's a big problem too. However, it's a trade-off again and is it a trade-off well made? At least there seems to be a consensus in the industry, in the community that what that's what we should do and I do believe personally also that is the right way to go. The thing is how far are we from having people using it? Well, uh, again, uh, only 15% of the US internet users are using it. So that's not ideal. Uh, that means we have a very, very long way to go to drive adoption of that technology. It might seem something which is well known and everyone is using it, but in reality, it hasn't even reached mainstream just yet. That is as surprising as it is, but about a year ago before the pandemic, when we ran the survey, it was very clear that people were not in the habit of using uh, a password manager. That's why having them directly built in into the web browser is a good way to drive adoption and keep furthering the idea that you need to let the browser under your credential for you which would go back when we talk about security, which is even another layer of where you should let your hardware prove who you are rather than you doing it because there is less room for errors and it make it more secure. Similarly, uh, on the flip side of that, some people do use a password manager as they told us, well, they use a piece of paper. So is it's also again, a single piece of uh, point of failure. So replacing a piece of paper with a password measure, I would argue is better 
uh, because at least you can have a copy, a cold storage of it, or maybe there is a recovery mechanism built in and so forth. So I think it would be better an upgrade from the piece of paper to the password manager. So yes, password manager do create a uh, single point of failure. However, user, when they use a piece of paper and things like that, already have one that they might not be even aware of or haven't sort of the idea that they might lose it and then they might have a huge problem with it. So until password manager are used everywhere, uh, there is a need uh, to try to add an additional technology, way back to combining technology, right? Um, to try to mitigate password use risk. And that's one of the things that our team has been working on for about five years. Um, and so it all started, at least for me, uh, I'm not sure that's the exact date, but this whole journey on what can we do about password use started for us a little bit before 2014. But in 2014, uh, here's a screenshot that emerged on the Bitcoin forum, uh, which said, hey, here's a list of tens of thousands or I think hundreds of thousands of Gmail accounts with their password. Um, and that, that bleed down to Reddit and that bleed down everywhere. I think, uh, people are anxious about the thing, which is normal. And so we start to get a lot of inquiry at Google about, well, are you, are you guys compromised? Is this leak real? What, what is happening, right? Password leak and password values were not like that mainstream at the time. And so people were like already going into the place of Google is compromised. Oh my God, the world, oh my God, what can we do and so forth, right? And so, We've been looking at those paths for them for a while internally, and we made a decision uh, in September that so a few days after this leak come in and to actually come on to record that, yes, we are aware of it, and yes, we are looking after it, and actually we do uh, password, we have a password reset program, which is something I helped kickstart a, a while back a few, I think a year or a year and a half before. Uh, we went on record and talked about it. But yes, we said, yes, we are aware of it. And actually, you know, uh, one of the things we do is resetting your account when you when there is in the path for them that we are aware of. And the reaction was extremely positive and we got a lot of users say, well, that's great, you should do that. Thank you for looking after us. And so we saw that Password reset is becoming a big deal and we started to invest more into all those understanding of credential and all the path paper I mentioned earlier in the introduction were coming from this idea that we saw it rising as a massive problem and we were really wanted to be in the front line and try to find solution or mitigation as early as we could. And so over the year, we become more sophisticated and more reactive and improve our system and detection and warning system. And then overall, I think by 2018, uh, we have reached a point where we have reduced about 110 million uh, plus account at Google. So we found at least 110 million of our users who had their login and password, both of them valid. And we did reset them and send an email to you say, hey, we have to reset your password because you're compromised. Uh, we got uh, a lot of people asking us to do more. So for example, I do believe, uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure when we started, but I think it's about 2016, uh, we started to do it for uh, enterprise consumer, G Suite. Uh, out of requirement from them, they were very, say, well, you, I, I see that for my personal account, can we get that for uh, work, Google for Work account? And we say, sure, we can do that. And so the so program naturally expanded from users, Google users, to Google users and Google for Work users. And then we said, okay, but then how about we try to do it for everyone on every web services? We got a lot of requests from other company, um, for example, I did a lot, I got a lot of them at conferences say, hey, you have this program, we heard about it, are you willing to share credential, can we do that? And of course, you can't really share stolen credential with other companies, so there are a lot of complexity, but the idea is that together as a community, we can reset those accounts and in a way devalue the black market was uh, something we really wanted to do. So we go back because we're researching to the drawing board and we're like, okay, what would be a acceptable system that people would love and would use uh, that will warn them when there's a data breach. So the first thing we needed is it has to be accurate and actionable, which means, and as based on our experience, we do not reset password when there is your username in the data breach because we don't know if the password is correct. We do reset if and only if the username and the password are the same. 
right? Because your username, your email might be there by mistake. Someone might have created an account on, on your behalf. You don't even know that because you have a common email. Uh, so we want it accurate and actionable. So that's like username and password, which of course poses a lot of problem because you can't really share a password. So it also has to be automated. As I mentioned, user understanding of the security posture they are in is at best flaky. And so we want to make sure we don't put more decision and more burden on them also for usability reason. If we can automate all everything, why, why would you bother the user with some of the decision when it's, if it just protects you, then you know we should do that. And last but not least, as I said, because you want to be actionable and you want to be automated, you have to find a way to make it in a way which is privacy preserving. And I think that is the, the thing we really brought to the table is this understanding of how to combine those things um, and making sure the password reset system we will be able will actually fit those triangle. And there is a non-trivial solution to get there, which is uh, using a private set intersection, which is essentially a cryptographic way for you to query a database without revealing what you are querying for. So you can say, hey, here is a login and a password, and then you encrypt them with a private set intersection, and you query the database we have. And again, we cannot ship the database to the user because remember, it's like five, six billion credentials of that terabyte of data. Uh, and we also don't, so we, we had to find a way for the user to compute a very fancy hash. Again, everything is hash. There is no password in clear on our side. And the user is computing these privacy preserving hashes. So we learn nothing about them. We compare them to the database. And then uh, all you can get out of this query is yes, it's in the database. No, it's not in the database. And that Google learned nothing about it. And I think that is a crux of the comfort of the user to accept this as a system is like, you can check, but then you do not reveal anything. And I think that was really the contract we needed for our users, which is why, for example, we did the extra step of working with Academia, have our protocol being peer reviewed. Uh, I put a link into the, the slides, uh, which is peer reviewed and actually won best paper award at using security on how the protocol exactly works so people can look at it and say, yes, I do believe this is true and the claim are correct. And yes, we have experts who have independently vetted that what we do is the right way. Uh, we actually got a lot of good feedback from the community. Uh, it was a very valuable uh, journey because they found ways to even further improve our scheme to even reduce, even put on short leakage uh, on how we construct the protocol. So we really got a lot of value and our user by return got a lot of value of this openness on how to design this system. Uh, which is correct, currently known as password checkup. Uh, another short thing we did, <laughs> which is uh, maybe less uh, user facing, but very important for us was to make sure that we added additional cryptographic mechanism to the protocol uh, because we didn't want malicious actor to be able to basically uh, leech the database out of our system, right? As we were collecting all the data breaches and doing a huge effort into uh, you know, like streamlining them. Uh, we certainly didn't want uh, to be like a fast download point for people. So there's a lot of um, slow hashes we do. And every time you query it, actually it's very expensive. So we actually make it really, really hard to use the thing. You have to know what you query for. And then when you query, it's very slow. Now, again, trade off. If you do that on a mobile, that's harder because the mobile doesn't have as much compute power as a PC. So how you balance the security of the system with the ability for the user to run it and not like killing the battery is also an interesting uh, challenges, which is all detailed into the paper or the blog post we wrote about it. Okay, and so we do that and we keep iterating it and we have this extension uh, that we launch. I don't have a screenshot here, but basically we launch uh, this is an experimental thing called password checkup extension. And we tell the user, look, it's experimental. Would you like to have it? And the most amazing thing happened, everyone in the press love it. And a lot of people say, yes, you should install it, that's great. We really love it. I tested it, I found my compromised password, it's really useful. You should recommend that to people. And in a matter of a month for something we barely advertise, short of showing it to the press and writing it about it, uh, had 1 million users. So we got from zero to a million users uh, for our extension, which was a prototype on like 
would people like it? Well, we didn't want it to build it as a built-in product because we were concerned or we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know if user would like it, would it make sense? And so we had this overwhelming positive response. Uh, I never had any positive response about how the research we do ever to that scale. And it was fantastic to see. And then the team internally were very, very excited to help us and take it from research to a full product, which would become password checkup. And then password checkup was taken on, taken by the product team, the, which is in charge of Google accounts, uh, you know, systems. And they were building it into uh, the account system and that become password checkup, which is built in. And we did release it to as a uh, as a way to check up your account on the Google system as a Google uh, online services first, and then we we'll allowed people to uh, to do that, and we started to display warning uh, as you can see here on the screenshot uh, when people were entering a certain credential. Say, hey, you enter a certain credential, maybe you would like uh, to check your password, right? So that was the first warning we did. And this was only for people using the Google Password Manager because we wanted to uh, slowly roll it out. And again, there is a lot of complexity to roll out the peer, a peer, a section set uh, system at scale. It's very, very expensive and we wanted to make sure. So we did that and a lot of people really loved it. Um, uh, recently, uh, during an interview, Sundar said that the latest statistics are that we have about 100 million people who actually went to Password Checkup and then we have helped reduce 30% uh, usage of leak credential thanks to it. So you can see the vast, massive amount of reduction we got. And since then, um, the password checkup technology have reached an even broader adoptions uh, as it actually reached out Android. And now, uh, I think very, very recently, in the last few months, um, when you are entering a insecure password, logging and password into using the form filling system in Android, we will show you a password say, hey, you have uh, entered an insecure password, uh, login and password, please change your password, check your password, use password check up and change it so it's reaching Android. And so we hope to reach more people and help them uh, being aware that some of the credentials are stolen and hopefully get them to, as we saw, to change them to a more secure password. Uh, one of the benefits of password checkup is this is a moment where people pay attention so we can tell them and try to tell them a little bit more about password complexity and say, hey, you should not use something guessable and things like that. There are work to do better on that space, but I think we it's a huge step forward. And then, uh, of course, we also, there are the other team at Google who are experimenting with a lot of ideas on how to make even better proactive technology. I think proactive is very important. And one of them is we now have for a few months uh, something which proactively try to detect when you've been fished. So basically it's a client side thing on Chrome, which will, when you type, again, a password where you should not have, and then Chrome is thinks you are being fished, will tell you, hey, be careful, you might have to change your password. So the takeaway is proactive password do reduce, proactively reducing password do actually reduce attack surface. This is something which is very important. Uh, it's very, very important as a technology for the community. Uh, we hope to get it rolled out everywhere and that a lot of people would like this privacy preserving thing because there is a lot of upside and very limited downsides for the user. It's a little bit expensive to run, but I think it's completely worthwhile uh, to protect better users. And on the flip side of that, we still need to get people to use the password manager that will solve a lot of the issue mentioned and we are far from reaching mainstream and a large scale adoption and we should really all work together to do that. Okay. Uh, last section about how we preventing it, which is when we are sadly no proactive things have happened and the bad guy is entering your logging and pass compromised password to the system. So what can we do? Well, the first thing is if we only have a login and password, which is the old model, well, it's very, very dangerous, right? Because there is nothing, no extra information you can use directly or no extra direct information you can use to protect things. So what we, the obvious answer and the important answer, which is slowly getting strong traction is use additional information uh, to protect your accounts. Uh, for example, uh, what you are or what you have, right? And we have three type of two factors, right? We have what you are, which is your fingerprint, which is one of the things which is 
or your iris ca- or your face recognition, which is what most mobile phones are using those days and have a good uh, traction among the users. Users seem to really love those. Uh, also, for local users, to be clear, uh, we can also have uh, authentication about what you have, uh, and those are more like security keys. Uh, so those physical devices, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then what you know is your password, right? So ideally, you would like what you know, which is your password, plus one of those, which is what you are, what you have. So the thing is, two-factor would strongly increase security, of course. The problem is it's very, very challenging for many, many reasons. I'm going to outline. I don't have a great answer for them, but I can try to paint you a picture of why it's difficult. The first thing is only 37% of the user use any form of two-factor authentication. So again, not reaching critical mass just yet. Probably getting f- more and more, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I ran a study, I think two years ago, where I looked at how many uh, websites do support two factors. And we barely have 50% of the website who do support two f- to FA. Uh, sorry, uh, we don't even have 50% of the website of the popular website who use two-factor authentication. So there is a challenge that even if the user wants to use it, it might not be available. And if it's not available, they can't use it. So we have a lot of work to do in the tech community to get two-factor offered everywhere. Additionally, what makes this thing challenging besides the usage of uh, two, uh, two factors is that even for those websites who do use two factors, they might not necessarily follow the standard, right? They might roll out their own two-factor things. Uh, one of the things would be, for example, banks tend to have, as you can see on the chart, tend to have their own way to do authentication, whether it's through their own app or through like an SMS system or something like that. And as a result, the user have to have 20 apps or have to know 20 ways where things are a little bit different and not like exactly the same. And this lack of standardization, as I said, is very difficult because A, we ask a lot from the user if you have to install an app for every single service site, it's very complicated. We increase the cost, of course, because they might have to invest into, let's say, two hardware tokens. That was the case when some bank would give one hardware token and another bank would give another one. And, okay. and so we increase cost. And again, we increase the need for user education. And as I already mentioned, we have already a lot, long way to go for even basic threats. So that's probably not ideal. And this lack of standardization is one of the things which is really dragging down, in my opinion, the adoption of two factors. We also have part of non-standardization, people reusing, and hopefully it started to get fixed. A diff- we use terminology for marketing reasons, which make no sense. So for example, a security key in the security community is a, U- is a FIDO2 security key, right? The normal... Uh, the physical thing, which is divine, as you click on it, touch of presence, we know that. But the problem is some website, and it's an old example from PayPal, would call a security key something which is not a security key. So now the user say, I need a security key, but then the PayPal security key is not the same that is used by the industry, which is as a 5021, which is used by, let's say, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, GitHub, and so forth, right? And so now those marketing things, confuse the user even further. And so we create this kind of uncertainty about the user, where it should be actually very clear what you're supposed to do. So marketing is also getting in the way. So if I convince you that we need to invest into two factor, now the question becomes, or you already comment, which one should we recommend? So we did a study, uh, some people at Google did a study on what are the most secure type of two factors, right? And uh, they run this study vers- on boutique phishing, which is like your bulk phishing, normal, regular guy from the black market, and spear phishing, which is targeted services where you are targeting a specific account. And all in all, the most secure and only thing which have resisted every attempt is a security key. So we do believe security key is by far the most secure one, SMS verification being okay for bulk phishing, but clearly not good enough for spear phishing. So all in all, having those security key, which are really good because they are doing all the authentication for you. And this is a hardware device. And so you click on it and just do everything and it's almost unfishable is probably the way to go. And we should build this. And with uh, the security key, 
is a technology that Google is heavily among other people in the industry like Microsoft and other big players are heavily invested in because we believe that's the right solution, right? And the idea is you can have a physical key which you plug into your device and you click on it or there is also this called, thing called phone as a security key where your phone, you can click on it and then you choose the secure element of your phone to act as a security key and you just approve uh, through your phone, right? And that is probably the ideal setup for the user. And if we have a streamlined experience, which we start to have because with the version two of Fido 2, you now have a standardized UI on Chrome and Firefox and so forth, you have a consistent experience, right? And so the user will learn to recognize those pop-ups which are driven by the browser, not the website, and know what to do. So as we invest into that technology, the more we invest into it, the more it decreases the cost of owning a key and also increase the awareness of it so the user are more familiar with the technology and it's easier for them. So it's really, really important. We, we're going all as a community into one direction. So again, because we're research team, we were asking ourselves, okay, how do we help with this big issue? What can we do? And so our answer to that, we started a few years ago and is uh, slowly getting ready for production. It's called OpenSK which is a security key firmware, which is written in Rust. And the design principle behind OpenSK was to have something which is open source, has no patent, no ADA, so it can be affordable. So it's an open source, it's on GitHub, everyone can use it, every manufacturer can use it to build their own key. Uh, we're focusing on the quality of it. We wanted to have it secure by design, so we spend a lot of time and consideration about which OS we want. We use stock OS, which has a really good security posture and is written in Rust. It's an embedded OS, uh, which again, if you, are, if you haven't heard of it, is really, really good for I IoT and tries to solve this idea of having a secure IoT, uh, embedded, sorry, a secure embedded OS. Uh, very, very promising and we we really like it a lot. So we build on that, we build on Rust and we built the firmware using those. And then we were also, we are building a lot of toolings and a lot of um, tests around how to make it research friendly. So if you want to innovate in the space, we you have a place, you have a reference platform where you can test new ideas, test new algorithms, test new features, run experiments you would like, and make it friendly because we want to fuel innovation in the space of security key because we believe there is a lot which can be done. So the initial version of OpenSK that you can do today uh, if you want to build your own, uh, is you can buy a Nordic $5 uh, key, as you can see here, which run on a Talk OS, and you you will you can flash it. Right? We have instruction on the website, you plug it, you flash it, and then we even made a 3D case that you can 3D print and you can build your own, right? And that's what a lot of people did uh, when we released it. Uh, here's a picture of one of our uh, users who say, well, really cool, I, I, I do it, and then I, I build my own 3 decades, and so you can see them here, and people were really excited to, to build their own key. Uh, the downside of that is, of course, the key is not locked, so it's not really for production, because again, the key can be really flashed um, and so forth, so that's probably not what you want for production and not for end users just yet, but people were really excited. Um, and then this year, we reached a really, really important milestone for us, which is Fighten, which is one of the manufacturers decided uh, to create a key. Uh, we did help them and we did provide some technical assistance, but that's really them driving the idea of building a key. And for the first time, uh, although the key, again, is not ready for production because it was not a lockdown version they produced, we had a key who was FIDO2 compliant, FIDO2 working, it was not compliant at the time, but FIDO2 working for $9.99. Before us, uh, the, the cheapest key I could find was about $20, so we were able, by providing free software to drive down the cost, to a key which have a metal on closing. I have one at home. It looks really nice. I mean, it's not you know, super high quality, but it's really nice, sturdy, and so forth. Uh, we were able to drive adoption by manufacturer at least one, for now, uh, of uh, the firmware and get results on making affordable key. So 999 is a great milestone. I hope one day we get to 499. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know what is a bit of material who will have to look like for that, but we are on the right track and it was very exciting to see that. Uh, since then, uh, we got our key to be certified FIDO2. So OpenSK is now when you build one, uh, a FIDO2 certified key. We again took the cost of certifying the key and the firmware ourselves. So then when people manufacture them, 
they can manufacture them cheaper because they don't have to give to the user, to pass on to the user the price of the justification because it's already given to them for free. So again, this is the idea that we want to be standard, standard of course, but we don't want, we want to reduce the cost of standardized keys to the minimal uh, for, the, for the end user so we don't pass the cost to manufacturer. Uh, what we try to do for a security key would be a few things. One is try to do a FIDO 2.1 certification. So FIDO 2.1 is coming in. Uh, it's a new revision with a few addition. OpenSK already support most of it if you pull it from GitHub. Uh, or support all of it, I, I would say. Also, the spec is not final. There might be minor change. Uh, and so we on try to be the first 2.1 certified, which is this idea that we want to be the bleeding edge platform and always being the most up to date. Uh, we have a lot of ideas and we're developing a lot of new features outside of the spec to try to push even further and develop them, test them, and then bring back them back to the committee and discuss whether they make sense for the, for the spec. If you have ideas or if you're interested in the space, uh, talk to us about how to, you can experiment with uh, the security keys. Uh, we got already a few universities doing it with us. It's very exciting. And finally, um, at some point, we wish to talk with, find a way to partner better with industry even further to actually develop affordable, high quality security keys that people can buy for very, very cheap all around the world. And again, uh, the goal is really to drive adoption by having a good reference platform that is, that can be customized, right? I mean, if people want to do fancy key with it, of course they should, uh, or an affordable one. Uh, we are going, at least for us, we are trying to make it as affordable for anyone to build upon it. All right, so if you want more information about OpenSK, as I mentioned, it's all open source, it's on GitHub. Uh, here's the link. Uh, all right, so the takeaway is that passwords are not enough. Uh, passwords we use uh, and phishing attacks makes credential just raw password and login not enough, so we need to do something else. And a strong two-factor, which is a security key, is the way to go. And because not all the two factors are created equal, we really should zero in into using security keys. And we have a long way, long way to go. And there's, a, there's an effort as a community to really try to educate people about the importance of two factors and how to select a good one. Uh, so we reach universal adoption like HTTPS, which is now, I would believe, the most mainstream technology for security we, we have deployed, right? And it took a lot of revision and certificate transparency and stuff like this to really get there, but I think that the next big adoption technology is 2FA. All right, very briefly, <laughs> because this talk is already very long, uh, let's talk about advanced protection, which is something that Google pioneered a few years back, and we hope other companies take ideas from and can build their own, is sometime, uh, in general, I say, let's say with that, in general, large-scale attack don't care which account they compromise, right? For all the things I discussed so far, uh, people are interested in bulk compromise, right? Whether you scam John Doe or Jane Doe, it doesn't matter for the scammers. They just want to extract money by running, I don't know, like a phishing scam or like a money mule scam or whatever that is. However, we have some users who are targeted by state sponsors. We have people like journalists. We have people who are working with political organization or dissident who are at risk of a targeted attack where a state, nation state or a very powerful organization is going after them because they are high value target. And in that case, the attacker do not care about all the accounts, they only care about a specific account, but they would go to extreme lengths to get it. So those type of accounts uh, are very obvious, I would say, from journalists and activists to politician and campaign team to executive and fintech users. For, for example, people who do a lot of Bitcoin or Ethereum are routinely very highly targeted by bad guys because if they get their hand on the wallet, they can steal all the cryptocurrency and then, you know, it's a heist, right? And then it's um, irreversible. So when you have stolen Bitcoin, you can't even reverse it, which is make it for criminal, way more appealing than even bank accounts uh, access. And of course, celebrity because uh, people think they can monetize their photo or think they can steal from their account, right? So those are basically the user who are in need of something stronger, right? And that might be willing to increase their friction, right? 
So some of the threats we are concerned when we talk about those users are spear phishing, like very, very highly well-defined email who are targeted only for them and are really, really hard to spot. And again, machine learning might not catch them that easily because they are used one time or a few times. Uh, malicious auth app having apps on the phone which are specifically crafted for them to literally get access to their phone and do very specific actions. And of course, uh, account recovery attack, whereas the attacker have way more knowledge about the victim, so it's harder to verify. It's easier for them because they have more in context to break through account recovery. So, for example, uh, here's an example of a targeted attack where, well, uh, you can uh, get uh, you can fish people who use SMS, right? SMS is not enough for those people because you can do real time phishing uh, of the SMS code. It, is more technically difficult, but it's doable. And of course, uh, you have to be more reactive, but we are talking people who are really motivated here. So as I mentioned earlier, security and usability is a trade-off. And here, the thing is, we probably want to increase security, even though it's more painful for the user. A lot of the users with which we have proposed that solution or have come to us for asking for that solution are willing to make those trade-offs of we're going to make it harder for you a little bit, but then at the expense and then you have greater security. So what do we do? So first thing we do is you have to have a security key. We believe that the only unfishable token or research shows that is the only fishable token so far. So you need to have those. So you need to have two key, one key for your account and then a recovery key, right? So you have to have your phone and the key or something like that. So that's a cost. And yes, you need to have them with you, but that's needed. Uh, we do limit API access, so every old access, we restrict the scope you can go. Can't get Drive access, can't get Gmail access, although we did remove it for most users now. But you can't access your sensitive data through old because we are concerned about that. Uh, and then uh, we do a lot of things about stronger verification for account recovery, and we do extra scanning on your, on your session to make sure that everything which is suspicious will actually be flagged. Um, even if we have a shadow of a dub, I would say for a session squeezing. So to wrap up uh, the whole talk, um, strong account do require a layer in depth strategy where we have from prevention to proactive to add login time to second factors to strong account recovery. And there is no one technology which fix everything. However, there are a few technology which when they are applied would make the world a better place. Uh, as a community and as professional, we have to keep constantly keep up with adversary because they keep finding innovative ways or in, to bypass or entice user to give them their account. And then uh, when you deal with high value account, uh, you might have to consider to create a specific program for them, which is increasing further security at the expense of security at the expense of usability and those users, because they are very well aware that they are at risk, are more, more than often willing to make that trade. All right, um, that I think uh, concludes the talk. Thank you so much for listening uh, and thank you for having me today. I am uh, I'm really excited to engage with you and take questions uh, after, after, if you have any, and uh, you would be able to find the slide that I mentioned at the URL which is on the slide today, uh, the slide you can see. Uh, thank you so much. À bientôt.